There's a common misconception nowadays that even though music artists aren't making a lot of money with streaming and album sales through their recorded music, that they still make a lot of money with touring and live performances. But the reality is that bands often lose a tremendous amount of money when they go on tour. I feel very fortunate to be able to talk today with Sarah McDonald, who is an incredible singer, composer, multi-instrumentalist, band leader who runs her own band called the New York Chillharmonic, which is this awesome 18-piece progressive rock jazz orchestra and she knows a lot about touring because her band has toured across five different continents and she's also managed a bunch of other bands as well so I'm so excited to have her here to talk to me about the financials of touring. So traveling with a big band is a pretty unique experience mm -hmm. and there are 18 people in your band what is it like bringing all those people on tour do you bring the entire band with you every time mm -hmm. or just part of the band how does it work? Um, it depends if we're on the East Coast, like last June, I brought the entire 18 piece band, which was nuts. And then if we're touring like internationally or if I'm going to the West Coast, I will bring just the rhythm section, maybe a tour manager, and then I'll hire everybody else locally in each city. Wow. Yeah. And when you're hiring people locally, how do you even find them? Um, Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, on Facebook Marketplace, more or less. Um, <laughs> there are... <laughs> Like, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> Is it just friend recommendations? You just... Friend recommendations, yeah. Um, yeah. But I would usually hire 13 people per show because that's what makes up the horns and strings. So it's like 91 people. Got it. I'd hire the so you're hiring 90 people that you really don't know at all at generally generally that's insane. yeah like when we started i didn't know a ton of people but now the network expands and you make a ton of connections yeah mm -hmm. that's crazy so when you bring your, your rhythm section it's like drums bass guitar piano, piano me you do you rehearse with the people at all that you hire on the road or um i send all the information in advance like all the charts and recordings and because the rhythm section is with me they're very well supported we'll load in a little bit earlier make sure we're like super set up tell like the horn and string players to come later you just know. rehearse sort of at the sound check at the venue it's just a, like a longer sound check yeah, yeah. like we have a five hour sound check to the absolutely no. i kind of did that in the beginning i'd be like we're gonna run the entire set and that's just exhaustive and like not necessary yeah. and also i think there should be like a certain level of fear <laughs> involved when you're doing this yeah because if people like get too comfortable or you tire them out too much they're gonna make simple mistakes yeah so it's like you know it's like you're aware you know what it sounds like just pay attention sight read you know and then they're more focused and since you're hiring people on the road who you've never played with before do they ever show up and not sound good you just turn their microphone down at the venue or what how does it work <laughs> um it's happened for yeah. sure it's always string players no i'm kidding um and <laughs> it's hard to play a stringed instrument it's hard it's really hard in an ideal world i'd have like a string quartet usually that always goes great if it's like people who have played together a lot yeah. it's like they understand each other they know how to like tune to one another if it's just like a bunch of random people that haven't played together before it's like so much harder um but yeah there have definitely been times where it's like okay this isn't sounding so great i'm gonna go tell the sound guy to turn, just it, turn down. it down just that's turn so it down. funny and with strings it's like they have pickups so it's like really easy to just be like and you're done uh, <laughs> They're like, I'm not hearing myself. It's like, oh, That's it's so fine. We hear, you. we hear you on the audience. I hear you. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's so mean. It's not mean. It's totally, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. It's all about the aesthetics anyway. So. Um, I think it's probably particularly difficult financially to tour as a big band. I'm very curious to hear like what the financials are like behind that. Um. Yes. So... It varies, obviously. Um, I'm not at a point where I'm breaking even, and I'm sure like there are people that are going to see this that are in bands that are breaking even and like even being profitable. Um, I think for the most part, though, just because my project is so large, and I think when there are other groups that are, are touring with like a huge like production element involved or just like a lot of people on the road with them, it is really hard to make a profit. You know, if you're touring like a thousand cat venues and you're selling out and you've got great merch and all that stuff, um, then you're probably doing well. But like, I'm not at that point. My band is like kind of weird, <laughs> you know, all things considered. I don't suspect that I'll be playing like these giant venues unless you I'm like play the, big venues though I play big venues like for festivals and I think like when I go overseas like people are more like interested in like weird big band stuff it's not that weird oh thank you I don't know I just like I mean comparatively I it's not of, boring pop music but you. it's really good music it's not weird oh, I wouldn't describe it as oh and also I don't think of weird as like a negative weird in a good way just like different like unconventional uh -huh. you know people hear big band and they assume that it's yeah. jazz and like it's swinging but it's not it's just like a very big band if we have a solo it's like a rock solo and yeah. it's like always guitar I'm sorry it's 
it's, else. It's yeah. rock music, I would say. It's definitely like prog rock, and I hate saying like orchestral rock because that also sounds like the worst thing you've ever heard in your entire life. <laughs> no. But, <laughs> but like sometimes it is. I also like did record with an orchestra recently, so like I do have orchestral rock like in the works. But um, I'm so sorry. What am I trying to say? Um, touring with it is expensive. Yeah. Obviously, like I want to take care of people, and I just have so many more overhead costs than bands that are touring with like even like five to seven people. It's like every time we go somewhere, I have to get nine double hotel rooms and the most annoying thing in the world is that like when you book through like hotels.com or whatever you can only the max number of rooms you can book is eight really otherwise you have to like call a concierge service to do it for you which is like so stupid so i have to just like hope that they're not going to sell out so i book the eight rooms and then i have to like immediately scramble and book one more it's so ridiculous and they're like are you sure you really want to book one more room in this hotel i'm like yes i'm sure um which is hilarious so that's always like kind of a nightmare unless like a festival's putting us up then like that just takes care of that but then you do that and it's like they always put you in the hotel that like doesn't have breakfast and everyone's pissed because they want to eat so yeah so it's like you have to i have to make sure that there's like a gym and there's breakfast or people are gonna like lose their minds really yes like that's those are like the two filters that we need to have and then if we're people sane, to keep people sane yeah they need to like be able to move their bodies just trying to keep people from like killing me is generally what i'm you know that's like well you have to like take care of people when you're on tour you're like the band leader of course but you're also like their mother yeah everyone calls me mom (laughs) which like i feel like would bother some people i just think it's hilarious (laughs) it's just like where's mom i'm like And I'm like just the shittiest mom of all time. Just <laughs> no, like figure no. it out. So you recently did a 13 day tour that had six shows in it. Mm-hmm. Can you break down the expenses for that tour? Yes. 15K for all the musicians. That's and then we it. had one band open for us and I paid them a flat opening fee of $400. So that's $15,000. Um, oh, sorry. Not included in that is the $2,000 for the tour manager. And so he did like a lot of driving. So I use Master Tour when I tour, which is just like a software to like help you stay organized. And that's also nice because it'll update stuff in real time and it'll update per time zone, which is great. So like if you input like we're driving this distance, it will like give you real time updates of how long it's actually going to take you in the morning, which is amazing. Stuff like that, which I really like. And also you can just like, it's an app. So it's like I have the software on my computer. I can fill everything out and I would like give the tour manager my login so he could make updates as well. And then people just have like a read only view or they can like submit guest list requests that's like it yeah and then they just like it's an app on their phone and it's like okay this is lobby time whatever so it like just eliminates the stupid question yeah yeah (laughs) um problem which happens a lot because like if you put in an email that email disappears it gets like buried in their inbox and this way it's like you just have all that at your fingertips anyway that was a long yeah to rent one minivan was eighteen hundred dollars about a thousand dollars for gas the route that we drove, we landed in Portland, Seattle, and then we went up and around to Boise, Salt Lake City. Then we went to the Grand Canyon, which is Whoa. a huge amount of driving. And then we came all the way around to LA, and then we did came back to Joshua Tree, and then drove back to LA to fly out. Wow! I don't remember how many miles that was, but it's absurd. A lot. And like the West Coast is huge and super spaced out. Four hundred dollars for Ubers, like to and from the airport. Three thousand dollars for flights for eight people. $5,000 for hotel rooms and Airbnbs for six people for how many nights that is. $250 for the one time we had to rent backline and then $140 for a rehearsal space in Seattle to rehearse the drummer that was coming to sub. Wow. Yes. And then what about marketing costs? And then we move on. So for all promo and marketing, uh, I spent $4,250. Um, and this, to break it down, I did a Do Stuff Media campaign in Seattle, Portland, and LA. That was $2,100. For Facebook and Instagram marketing ads, I did $1,000. And then for a Bands in Town campaign, where they just like push your shows out to people who might like be interested in what you're doing, $300. I spent $300 on photographers. And then I spent $450 on tour posters, graphics to use. So the final cost for a 13-day West Coast tour with all of these people was $32,840. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of money for a 13-day tour. Kind of gnarly. Um, yeah, but honestly, like, with a band this size, and also because I've managed people and also, like, worked with friends and stuff, um, I, to me, that's, like, such a small number compared to things that I've seen before and also like if I had been on the tour for six weeks this would be like a big six figure number yeah like no questions asked and it's not because I just like I simply cannot afford to be on the road for that long it's all me paying for this stuff um I don't have management I don't have an agent it's like I'm booking these shows I mean I had a tour manager this time which is amazing who helped me advance Mm -hmm. and do something like handle logistical stuff and honestly I really needed it because I've done that before on my own and 
stuff slips through the cracks. I'm taking care of 17 other people. I'm doing like all the tour managing and, all, you know, dealing with all the logistics. And like, also I have to lead a band. Dude, I can't imagine. It's, you're totally insane. It's, yeah, it was too much. Having a tour manager was like, I will forever do that. I really needed it. And, you know, it's like he would just get in touch with the venue and deal with stuff that, like, I didn't want to deal with. Or if the venue was being difficult, he could, like, be my muscle a little bit. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I hate to say it, but, like, a lot of people do just, like, default to the man that walks in the room. Like, so often I've gotten up on stage and it's like everyone ignores me. And it's like, I get it. I don't really have, like, a huge setup. But they'll just, like, immediately go talk to the drummer or, like, go talk to the bass player. Yeah. Who are men or whatever. And I'm just, like... And I'm like, hey, like, I have to go, like, go introduce myself. I'm like, I'm Sarah. And they're like, oh, okay, great. I'm like, do you have questions for me? Like, this yeah. is my setup. You can ask me technical questions, believe it or not, Yeah. Um, as a woman. So, like, having that, it was just sort of, like, he will deal with it. And it's yeah. like, he can, like, kind of be the bad guy a little bit for me yeah, if he yeah. needs to be. And also, Very it's helpful. like, it just helps. Then I can just go and, like, rehearse the band. So what was your total income and then also the total loss? And I feel like I have to preface this because people are going to see this and think I'm insane, like... I am, but also, like, these are my choices. This is the size of my band. This is what I want to be doing, and I feel like, you know, that would be such an easy amount to spend on, like, recording an album with a project of this size. Yeah, so total revenue was about 10 grand, I think, including, like, what we made from shows and off of merch. Maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, but for the sake of consistency, it was 10 grand. And then for, so our total loss was $22,000, $22,840. Woo! Yes. A lot of money. Painful. But again, it's like I knew that was going to be the case. And people might be shocked to hear that, oh my gosh, that sounds like so much money. But right. that's like nothing. And I do think people just don't have any idea. They don't, they don't realize that that's even for a smaller band. Yeah, it just, it depends. Like some people are breaking even. I'm sure there are some bands that are going to watch this and like, that girl's an idiot. Why is she not making more money? But it's also like, I... Well, you're traveling with... You have a big band. This I have, is, like, a just... million people. If I was just touring, like, there were so many other expenses in here that if we had cut out, I would have been losing, like, maybe 12 grand or something, which, like, honestly, at the end of the day, it was, like, that's not that crazy. The shows did pretty well. Like, these were, like, all door deals, honestly. And each show did, I think, like, the worst. They were all door deal. Maybe explain what a door deal is, just for people who yeah. don't know. Basically, a venue can either pay you a guaranteed price, so mm-hmm. called a guarantee, saying, okay, if you play the show, I'll, I guarantee you will make at least, you know, $2,000 for the show, or you get a door deal, meaning you get just a percentage of the ticket sales. It can be a versus or a bonus deal. Usually it's a versus deal. A bonus deal would be like, okay, after a certain threshold, we're going to give you like an extra $1,000 if you reach like X amount of people. At sellout, we'll give you like this much. A versus deal would usually say that there's a guarantee. It'd be like, all right, here's $1,000 versus like 80% of the door, whichever one is greater. After like 80% because they're taking 20% in expenses, or they would say like, we're going to give you 80% after like XYZ. So they're taking an even bigger cut. Yeah. Never play a show that has a bar deal also because they will just take all your money and be like, I remember I had a venue in time that was like, Oh, our bar guarantee is $8,000. I was like, are you, are you out of your mind? That means people have to spend at least $8,000 $8, at the bar at for, the bar before you make any money, before you make any money. And also then we're taking like a cut at the door and I was like, kill yourself. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have definitely seen deals before with other artists. It's like their guarantee was like, eight grand and like they sold out so they wanted making like twenty seven thousand dollars which is nuts but the venue is also making a ton of money too especially if it's like yeah there are table minimums so the the venue is making a lot of money off of like food and beverage sales i see specifically so that's usually you'll see that more like they're already pocketing a lot more than like just a club with like a bar um and if there are people who are making like a ton of money off of touring it's probably a smaller group like i've I haven't managed these people personally, but like I know, like let's say it's like a, a an acoustic band that's not touring with like a ton of electric instruments or like acapella groups that like blew up on YouTube or TikTok. It's like they really don't have any like gear. They need to be like schlepping around. Like it's some it's four people, like super low overhead costs. Like they don't. It's like they all get single hotel rooms stuff like that. If they're playing to a venue that's like a thousand people and they're selling all this merch, they're making a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also like. Obviously, management and agents, like, they're taking a cut, things like that. They might have a business manager that's taking a cut, you know, hiring merch sellers, like, having a crew on the road. I mean, I guess it might not be a ton, but it's also, like, there are, a lot of artists have other streams of revenue, like, obviously getting, like, brand endorsements, partnership mm-hmm. deals, things like that. Or there's even, like, artists that create their own pedal, and so they're, like, profiting off of, like, something that they've created, um, you know, other things like having really good merch. I mean, everybody always says the money is in the merch. It really is. That's how you can like kind of like 
make up for these big losses. That's why merch cuts are so evil at venues. Yeah. They shouldn't be doing that. It's criminal. But, you know, there are more criminal things like streaming. People believing that music should be free. It yeah. should not be free. We should be paying for this. I have millions of streams on Spotify, like, all together. I've made, like, maybe, I can tell you right now exactly how much money I've made. Because I didn't put my music on Spotify for a long time. In the four years that I've been on Spotify, I've made $6,211. Wow. And that's from millions and millions of streams. And that's, like, maybe a couple million streams. Yeah. Not, like, millions and millions. But, but like, still. But still, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, if I had a dollar for every stream... We would be in a much nicer apartment right now. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, it's ridiculous. So, like, I'm not making money off of that. Like, I was on getting picked up on a lot of, like, algorithmic playlists. Like, maybe I'll get, like, $150, like, $200 a month. Which, like, okay. I'm not yeah. making the money back that I spent to record. Definitely not. Yeah. And before, I like, I really... He wasn't even, like, a super intentional boycott. I was just like, I'm not putting my music on Spotify. I had, like, one of the top-ranked-selling big band albums on Bandcamp for years. Wow. Because people actually bought it. And I made, like, good money off of that. And the second I put my music on Spotify, that all went away. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so sad. So what was the total you spent on touring last year? Just on the, like, the New York chill in general last year with touring, recording, merchandise, everything that goes with the band was... Ninety-seven thousand one hundred forty-one dollars and fifteen cents. So that was your total expenses for the year for your band. My total expenses Holy for the year. Boy. Yeah, violence. That's an assault on just like my well-being <laughs> as a person. Yeah. So, you're sort of an expert in this whole topic of touring financials, I think, because you also have managed a bunch of artists as well, artists mm-hmm. of different sizes, some very big and some smaller. So you have a kind of an idea of the range and the, mm-hmm. and the money breakdown. Obviously, we won't talk about specific bands, but... Not for um, sued. Yes. No. <laughs> but um, I'm curious, you know, obviously there must be a certain point when a tour does become profitable for a band. How big do you have to be as a band to get to that point where you're finally profitable? Yeah, that's a tough one just because there are so many variables that are involved with, like, being successful on the road. Um just purely from breaking, like, like just breaking, just from the tour cost, not being like profitable as a band overall, but just from, are they making money touring? Wow. Okay. If they're making money touring, it's making sure that you get guarantees that not only cover your expenses. Um, I would say like for a band that has, let's say like seven to eight people in it, um, they would need to be playing, man, this is so tough because it's like so different for everybody. They would need to be playing, I think like 500 to 1,000 cap rooms with like like high guarantees, which would definitely mean like higher ticket prices. So you need to be selling out at a higher ticket price. You need to be selling a lot of merch and you need to not have a ton of overhead costs. And usually what winds up happening is like when you reach that like level of success and you're, you're selling out rooms that are that big, your team grows. And so it's like more people are taking a piece of the pie. So to be like financially viable becomes harder and harder. But you know, it's a constant. It's just like this. You're walking const- up a down escalator. It, exactly. You're literally trying to sprint up an escalator that is just like the stairs are falling. Yeah. Like it's just, it's impossible. Um, and really like I worked full time last year and I've worked like in a bunch of different capacities, like working with different bands, working with different artists for like my entire career. Like, and, and that's how you pay for your band. Cause there's, right. you know, exactly. Like you I have to work another job because it's impossible. Otherwise. Five. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I worked like just so much. I was sometimes working like a hundred hours a week. It was nuts. And like also while I was on the road, because I can't just like take time off to like, you know, do my own thing all the time. Yeah. Like there is no such thing as like vacation days when you work in artist management or, yeah in marketing or whatever it is. I really overextended myself. I really wanted to like make as much money as I could. I really wanted to push myself and I wanted to make the band happen. And I felt like, look, if we really get ourselves out there and like we're starting to get, and it takes so much time and I don't like have the luxury to like go on the road constantly. I also do not have like the resources to go on the road constantly and like build up a fan base and do it like super DIY. It's like, I have so many people to take care of. Yeah. You know, I can't just be like, Hey guys, we're going to like sleep. We're going to camp and just like make it happen. I'm sound like a metal band. Like, you know, yeah. not just I want it to be. It's like, no, you no. Know, everybody has different levels, levels of comfortability. And like, you have to accommodate that because they're there for you. And I have zero problem with that. Like, no complaints, and I'm happy to do it. And also, like, I want to sleep in a nice bed without bug beds, like bed bugs yeah. also, you know? It's harder, so it's like every time we go out, it really counts. It's really important, and it's like maintaining momentum when you can't be on the road for a hyper-extended period of time and being able to, like, build a fan base. Because, like, now we are going out and we are getting guarantees, but it takes years. It's taken me years because I haven't had, like, some explosive, like, viral thing. Mm-hmm. I am not getting, like 
crazy endorsement deals. You know, I don't have a, I can't open for bigger acts. That's another thing. Like that's usually how a lot of people grow their fan bases because their band is smaller or they're willing to downsize or travel solo. So you can op open for a bigger artist and capitalize on their fan base. I have, I cannot do that. No one is going to hire a big band to open for them. It's just never going to happen. So it's like everything I do, I have to do by myself. And also like the tickets I'm selling are on me. Like having an opener is me losing money. And so it's like, I have to like, have a really captivating show all on my own that's like long and also like it has to be able to sell by itself so right. it's just like it's a lot of things and I realize like these are again are my choices like I've made it like as difficult as humanly possible for me to be successful um but I really like love the band I believe in the vision I think people like it too you know it's like it's well received when it is received and it's just what I want to do. And if I wanted to do something smaller, I would like, but this, the New York chill is what it it's is. It's so special and it, it is awesome. And there's something very special about hearing a big band live, like hearing all those instruments all at once. Your music is just so cool. Your arrangements Thank are just you. so, I'm glad you're still pushing through and doing it, even though it's so difficult financially. So you were working full-time job while touring. What is that like trying to manage those two things at once? Sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's really tough. I mean, it, what's weird about working in the arts is like stuff ebbs and flows just as much as your own stuff ebbs and flows. So like sometimes there's really not a ton to be doing. It's just kind of like maintenance. Um, and then other times, the June tour last year, I remember was like during some big announce for work I was doing. I'll keep it vague. But it was, and I anticipated it being like done by the time I left and it just wasn't. Like mm -hmm. it dragged on. And that was like, so I was really just not sleeping. <laughs> it was just tour, yeah. the whole tour. I really did not sleep. It was just like working nonstop, but I like adrenaline kept me going, like, thank God. And I was excited about what we were doing. We were playing like bigger festivals and stuff. And, and it really was great. And I think it like, you know, it was all worth it in the end. Like everything we did was always worth it. It brings the band closer together, like unifies the sound, it unifies the people. Like everybody's like such good friends. It's such a good hang. I'm so grateful for that. It could be so many other things and there have been like times where it wasn't as great you know but like you build on it and you grow and it's like there have been so many times I could have been like easily deterred from this but like I think mm -hmm. I just you just get used to like being yelled at <laughs> a lot I don't know yeah. or no it's like you develop a thick skin like you realize how things work you understand it at the end of the day it's like everyone's just trying to like look out for themselves and like everybody's doing their best mm -hmm. it's like I really try not to take things personally and it's um and I don't, I think, which is which is great. Finding venues that can accommodate a band of this size is already tricky. I can't just like tour like super DIY and play like smaller venues and fill them. It's like if I'm gonna be playing like a 300 cap venue, it's like that's stressful. Especially if I'm going to like a new city, I'm like I don't know if I'm gonna sell 300 tickets. The answer is I'm not going to. But mm -hmm. you know, I do the best that I can, and if I can get like 100 people out, great. You yeah, know, it's like playing Boise. I think we had about that, and I was like, dude, hell yeah, I've never been to Idaho. Like, I'm, this is amazing. And they were psyched about it, you know. But yeah, it's it's tough. It's a struggle. And, you know, I think I, this is just like what called to me. If I had a smaller group, maybe that would, I, but I don't know. It's like, would that be as successful because the way that I write doesn't lend itself to like Yeah, but then ensembles. it wouldn't be what it is. And it's, you yeah, know, it's special what it is. So, you know, you got to stay true to the music always. Thank Otherwise, you. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, literally, what is the point? It's like, what are you doing this for? Just to like be gimmicky and like... Yeah, you'd be better off getting a normal job, making more money, and being, having a more normal... You know yeah, what I mean? It's exactly, like, totally. The whole reason why you're going through this, like, insanity is because you care about the music, and so... Right. At the end of the day, it's like, I really do just If you're not the staying true to the music, there's literally no point. Truly. I couldn't yeah. agree more. It's like, I, I think what I do, I do with integrity, and I'm obviously being, like, super transparent about the amount of money and, like, time I've spent on this project, and you know that information I think is like very valuable to people I think I, I don't know if I mentioned this before but like a year ago before the June tour I like posted on Instagram I was like how much do you think it costs to tour with an 18 piece band and minus like one dude who also has a big band um everybody was viciously what off. did people guess they're like maybe like 10 grand maybe like seven grand I was like for a week yeah like what do you mean like the hotels like yeah <laughs> um I have seen six figure losses on tours where people are making guarantees between like eight and twelve thousand wow. dollars because they have a huge team and you know everyone's getting a piece of the pie they have a lot of like overhead um band salaries paying for you know it's like there's so much stuff something that people don't think about you have to file like tax forms in advance before you tour internationally every country has its own tax deductions so oh God. when i would make budgets you have to like calculate all that stuff in advance like this is how much we know we're gonna have to pay out in taxes because obviously those numbers fluctuate because like the dollar does not always equal oh whatever oh. everywhere like currency is different everywhere um yeah. some countries have like really high tax withholding also just like international flights paying for a tour bus for like six weeks is like 
what is it? It depends. It can be anywhere between like 80,000 euro. I think that's probably about what we... S- I don't want to give away 80, too 80,000 euros for six weeks for a tour bus? Yeah, plus you got to like pay the driver too. Yeah, so it's oh like people gosh. don't, you know, and that's like an overnight sleeper bus. But then yeah. you're still getting like day rooms sometimes because like you can't all use like the same grimy shower all the time. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. You've got to pay for like, and you're sleeping over. It's rough. Like you're sleeping overnight in these buses. You're tired and then you're like going to sound check and like playing these huge shows, um, taking all of your gear. It's like really rough on your body. And your spirit. Again, like I cited the acapella stuff. Basically, like, eliminate as many overhead costs as you possibly can tour with the least amount of people possible. And, like, also, like, have other ways in which you are reaching your fan base. I think people who are, like, really successful on Patreon or really successful on YouTube, it's like they already kind of, like, have this thing to pull from. Or if you can establish a really solid Patreon presence. I know a lot of people that make, like, a ton of money that way. Um, but that's hard. And that's also, like, requires so much time. Like, you have your YouTube channel, like, editing videos, doing all this stuff, creating, like non-stop content it's not just like whatever no, i'm gonna no, make a, a video work, it's yeah. many many hours yeah it just takes a considerable amount of time and i think managers and like agents are a little like hesitant to approach me i have been approached i've been approached by labels i've been approached by a bunch of stuff. like i think they just don't quite know what to do with me and one of the first questions they always ask is like can you downsize and i'm like no so really? oh that's so crazy like there are some bands that are really successful because they just have like phenomenal branding and they put on really great live shows and then their Spotify listenership is like super tiny yeah also like those things you are not exact metrics of someone's success like the Spotify plays the Spotify oh plays yeah no things. definitely yeah not. it does not mean you're gonna have a sold out show if you have like a yeah. hundred thousand Spotify listeners it might just mean that like you got on a couple really good playlists yeah. and then you know people added you to their personal playlists right. and um yeah that's always a crazy like a lot of like established jazz artists don't they don't like have like no Spotify listeners, but they're you know they've been like playing the festival circuit in Europe forever because yeah. like that's what, that's what people want to see and like people over there are I don't know if they're necessarily buying albums in Japan they are but like everywhere else they want to go out and see live music there's like a culture for that which is like a whole other topic but um, yeah in the United States is hard like there's not enough funding for the arts there mm-hmm. aren't enough grant opportunities it's expensive with inflation stuff is way too expensive way too expensive there's like a monopoly on like mid-sized touring vehicles and a lot of them are like should be decommissioned and are like not fit to have people sleeping on them let alone driving them um yeah and that stuff too and also it's like you have to book that stuff so far in advance and sometimes they will just double book and they'll be like sorry we canceled your reservation and you're just like left scrambling what? to find another vehicle yeah it's that's yeah. uh, i've seen that happen before the industry is a mess. There are some good people in it that really look out for your best interest, but for the most part, it's just really rough. If you can tour solo and open for a bigger act, that's probably how you're going to like pick up more steam and like also be successful, make money. But a lot of opener fees range between like 250, but like pretty much base pay to like per show, per show which is nuts. If you're touring with five people, you're not making any yeah. money to like maybe high end like i would say like very high end is like 500 dollars. yeah that's why if you can play by yourself that's the best way to go because then you could just keep the 250 yourself but if you have a five piece band you're just splitting only 250 dollars amongst the fights like insane. yeah what's the largest amount of money you've ever seen a band lose on a specific tour as a manager definitely in the six figures Wow, that's crazy. For so sure. people are losing over $100,000 on a tour. Well over $100,000. It makes your uh, 22000 not look so bad. Yeah, I'm just like, <clears> okay, <throat> whatever, it's like chump change. But obviously, also not everyone has the luxury to do that. Not everyone can like front that kind of money. Um, How do you front the money? Just be independently wealthy. I don't know. I mean, So like, basically only wealthy people, people who are independently wealthy can tour at this point. Like To tour, I would say like at that <laughs> scale, um, yeah, kind of. Kind the arts of. are for rich people only now, I see. Yeah. A little Unfortunately. Bit. It yeah. depends. Like, I know this no, is... No, no, it's not true. But. It's not true. And, like, and that's the thing. Like, this is such a difficult topic, and I feel like some people are going to have a lot to say about it, because, like, these are my experiences. This is what I've seen and observed. I also know bands that, like, are touring successfully. They're much smaller. Um, they, I think what you And can, when you say smaller, you mean they have fewer people in the band. A lot fewer not people. Not small in the sense of their success. So for, like, smaller ensemble sizes, um, if it's, like, two or three people who have, like, a huge fan base, like, they're making good money. Some other groups will not have management. They'll just have an agent. Mm. And it's, like, if you're super organized and you can take care of all this stuff yourself, like, that's an easy way to, like, eliminate 
noise because also managers are uh, managers are helpful because they're always looking for like new and innovative ways for you to make money and like what be... kind of cuts do managers usually take every artist is different it's like if they have a really successful patreon we're going to commission on it sometimes we'll commission on their album sales like off of their streaming if they're doing a lot of money on streaming because we manage everything like every single I, aspect so of managers it. usually commission off of basically all income yeah it depends if some like sometimes we'll be like no or if a band is just kind of starting out if they're already losing a ton of money we're not going to take a cut which is nuts because like you know overseeing a tour that size is so all of your it's time so much work yeah so stuff like that commissioning off the tour i guess it would be between like i've seen between like 11 percent and like i'm sure some people are commissioning like 20 percent yeah off the top if a band is really successful they're taking that money and that's a lot of money 20 percent is a lot and then huge. taxes on top of that it's crazy yeah. yeah it's freaking nuts and then like paying everybody and then also if your agent is taking like another 15 percent, that's pretty i would say like around 10 to 15 percent. i guess it's like a little bit more standard 20 percent is super and high. the manager is not taking the cut of your profit it's just of your income so that's why the artist can still be left in the red if it's like totally and yeah sometimes we, we will work out where it's like okay we're taking this percentage like after you pay out like taxes yeah. and fees it just it depends it, it depends all the be. time yeah. this is not like a clear-cut thing do you have any advice for marketing your band when you go on tour um what i will do when i reach out to like a new it's like if it's a brand new market i'll be like send me your media list sometimes they're not very updated so you kind of just got to go through them but like and i'll reach out to press and stuff and that has been helpful i've gotten some like interviews and things um yeah. and having press is really beneficial i did that a lot on the june run and i did like a even like got like a tv spot and a few other things and it was helpful, like yeah. really helpful. It got people out that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. Yeah, and that stuff is free. Like there's all kinds of free marketing that you can do, obviously. I think there is a lot of strength in still doing like posting flyers, you know, like asking the venue to do that stuff or like hiring a, a street team or whatever it is, like whatever you can do. It's like none of it is off limits. Like whatever you can think of, just do it. Sarah, you are one of the most hardworking hustlers I know. Stop. No, it's true. <laughs> and yeah, I think it's incredible what you're doing. And I'm glad that you have the... The, the strength to push through all these obstacles because it's so hard what you're doing and I don't think I don't think many people would be able to but it just shows kind of what a tough person you are that you can push through all that thanks or delusional or both <laughs> what happens if you don't have all this money up front to pay things out on tour I mean if the, if the losses are this huge you know you might not always have that much money in your bank account how do you handle that I was working very consistently last year so I always knew the money was coming in like every week which is why I felt more like emboldened to like take these huge risks but I definitely ran into like some I got laid off at the end of last year which was rough and it was like in the midst of like paying back all these people and it was not like hey it's like I'm never like hoarding money like yeah. if I'm late paying somebody it's not because I'm just like sitting there like I don't want to give you my money it's like I literally have like negative two thousand dollars in my bank account and I'm just like waiting to get paid or something and you know people are gonna see that and think it's super irresponsible and like you're right it is super irresponsible but um these are my experiences these are the choices I made these are um, my choices these are my choices I've chosen to do this I've crazy stuff I've and chosen my to, choice right my yeah responsibility no it's true yeah my responsibility and it's like I'm never gonna not pay somebody That's that's not that's not how I operate yeah and like I don't have rich parents I feel like it's really important that I say that I've always had a full-time job until this exact moment in time if um, only you did right if only I had rich parents I would be just touring all the time yeah um yeah but I I don't come from money like I came to the new school on a full scholarship there's no way I would have been able to go if that weren't the case I always worked part-time jobs I like never had a day off and I hustled and like found like I have a vocal jazz degree with the can you do with that and then uh, like nothing and I worked to like work on the other side of the industry starting out as like a booking assistant moving up to being like an agent artist manager marketing director like I really hustled do you have any advice for someone who maybe wants to try going on their first tour I mean don't no yeah. I'm kidding um just keep your expectations very realistic you know if you have a smaller group like play the smaller shittier venues like don't overextend yourself trying to like play a huge place with a ton of overhead that's like you know beware of the deals that people are sending you make sure that they're like more in your favor do the hard work market the show like spend time on promotion that really is helpful i'm not great at making content but i kind of just try to keep posting i make sure that there are like photographers at my show so i have stuff to like follow up with i you know or i'm like videotaping stuff or whatever it is getting behind the scenes footage it's like just keep that stuff in mind and you know try to like save up if you can in advance there are some like touring resources i would check out like jazz road touring i got one of those grants once which was like relatively helpful um 
And there aren't a ton of opportunities like that in the United States, which is rough. But, you know, do what you can. Um, do a small crowdfunding campaign if you need to rough it. I would say, like, if, if your band is on the same page, like, crash at people's... Able to. Yeah. yeah, if you're able to, like, crash at people's houses. You know, like, cut your expenses if you have... If you don't need a van to tour and, like, somebody has a car, use that car. Um, just make it happen. If you really want to make it happen, you will. And I think that's just like what separates me from people who like, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed by it. There were definitely times where I was like, Oh my God, like the amount of money, like the amount of time, like I would panic, you know, before tour, I'm just like, Holy shit. Like, I don't know if this is going to be successful. And it always, I found it too overwhelming for myself. I mean, I I used to go Mm. on small tours, um, but it's just, it was too, too stressful. And I could, I couldn't stand the fact that it, I was losing so much money and it was just like, yeah. I was like, well, this is, what's it for? Like I, I couldn't personally handle it. So I mean, it's, it's very easily, easy for that to overwhelm someone. So totally. And I do get overwhelmed. Like there are times <laughs> where I'm just like, what the f- am I doing? Like, oh my God. But you know, it's like you learn so much with each of those experiences. And I think it's just like, it's how you, it's what you want to do. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. The way that I spend my money, it's, it's hard for me to justify certain things. Like even buying stuff for myself is like weird to me. I'm like, well, I'd rather spend that money on like going on tour, which like is hard because I love shopping, but you know, whatever. But like, <laughs> but you know, it's like, that makes me feel like spending like $300 on like clothes makes me feel disgusting even though I, I still do it but um but you even know you spending $22,000 on a tour like, like to me yeah, yeah yeah like makes sense I'm like 30k for a tour yeah of course like yeah. that's no problem but then I'm like ugh, I'm like oh shipping is $10 oh, I'm not gonna do it it's just like it's, that's all humans though we have a very weird right. split of what we're willing to spend how do you money ch- on and not money on exactly and I feel like that's a little bit how I feel about recording sometimes I'm just like oh this is gonna be like this one thing and I get that I'll have it but then it's like and then it kind of goes away sort but of but it does exist forever it does that's exist the beauty forever of, recording. of course and I need to like you only have to do it once and then it's always existing and then it's always existing whereas a live show it. you do it and it's, it's forever but I love playing yeah. live and I think it's just like that's always been my dream like I grew up in musical theater and like my parents musicians and that's why we have no money and that's um yeah I just loved it I love being on stage I I was just like a little ham and I don't know it feels the most natural to me and like being with people I love playing with people meeting new people I've always loved that though I was like telling you my family was in the military so we moved all the time and I just like loved it I love going to new places I love making new connections I just think it's fascinating and invaluable and like going on tour like this and getting to meet all these musicians in different places is amazing and also I can connect people all the time you're like do you know a viola player in Salt Lake City I'm like yeah bitch Um, or whatever it may be it's like all over the world like we've you know I've gotten to play on in so many places and that's cool I like having that network yeah that's that's fat it's amazing not everybody gets to do that it is a privilege you know it's a privilege that I've paid for but um yeah it's because I want to so to sort of end on a good note, what is this progress that you see from going on tour, both for yourself and for other bands that you managed? What's the, you know, mm-hmm. there there is progress in, what is it? Yeah, there is progress. It takes a lot of time to build up fans. I have seen like people tour markets. It doesn't do as well. They go back to where the same market does a lot better. Like that six figure loss quickly turns into like a small five figure loss, which is like not bad in the grand yeah. scheme of things, or it's a break even, or you're in the green. I think when people can get into trouble, it's like you get excited and you start spending more money on things. So you see that you're doing well and you're like, well, now I can afford X, Y, Z and I should add this and add this and like bring an opener on the road and stuff. And it's like, it's all taking away from the pot. So it's hard. It's it's hard to remain focused, keeping your eyes on the prize. But it does pay off. And we got better guarantees for festivals last year than we ever have. Hell um, yeah. Yeah, which is great. In the beginning, I would go and play shows internationally. I was very alone and very lonely. I was, like, in my 20s going and, like, working with these big bands all over the world. And it was just me traveling by myself, which I do love. But it was, like... I didn't feel nearly as supported. It's like trying to teach, you know, we'd have to do so many rehearsals, like teach a rhythm section. Sometimes there's a language barrier. I've had like, you know, translators with me. That's tough. And it's like, if they don't, if, especially if you don't have a lot of like resources, but now I have so many examples of what the band sounds like. It's much easier and I would probably have an easier time, but like, you don't always know what you're going to get. And like right. working with the same people, it's like they're speaking the same language as you, but doing that by myself was tough. And I was like technically making money because it was just me mm-hmm. and I'm not touring with all these people. I'm like going to individual cities and like just bringing my music. Uh, but the quality was not the same and it's not any fault of like the people I was playing with. It's just like, how can you possibly like replicate that level of musicianship with people you're just meeting compared to people you've been playing with forever and it really the difference is just bringing the rhythm section because that is like it's a rock band at the end of the day and the foundation is that and like sight reading 
you know, strings and horns, like having that kind of support also pushes you, propels you to play better. And if you don't have that kind of support, then it's like everyone's timid and it just like creates more complications. So to go from that to being able to bring people on the road to like finally touring with all 18 people, which is like something if you told me like five years ago I'd be doing, I would be in complete disbelief. It's like sometimes you have to remind yourself of like how far you... It's such a feat. It is. Yeah, it's like I was like, oh my God, one day, like if I could bring everyone, can you even imagine how great that would be? And it was great, but it's like, and then it happens, but it's like a natural progression. So sometimes you lose sight of the fact that you're like, man, I was like, I would have killed... To be where I am now. Yeah, to be where I am now and to be doing these things. And now that I am, and now it's like, now we can go play club club dates and make guarantees. And if we do play a festival, it's like, I know we're going to be taken care of. and, And that's crazy. And... It may seem like, oh my oh. god, when I first started this band, I would have like never. I just thought it was gonna be like a goofy one-off kind of really? thing. Yeah, totally. I like I like the Herf Alpert Young Jazz Composer Award, and I was like doing big band stuff. It was much jazzier, not very focused. And I applied to like go to for grad school. I got in, but they didn't give me any money, so I didn't go. But um, yeah, just like thinking about that and being so like afraid of it and like not even able to make eye contact with the band to now it being like, like in my last gig, people asked me if I do stand up. So you are very funny in your live shows. <laughs> She's hilarious when she performs. Seriously. Thank you. I think it's mostly just like really unhinged at this point. But um, no, yeah, like the whole hilarious. thing is it's like it's a show. You and have like... very good stage banter and you're Thank very you. funny. Well, I hope that you all can check out the New York Chill Harmonic because it is honestly one of the most unique just incredible bands, incredible music I've heard. No, I'm serious. It's like it's like nothing you've ever heard. Like gassing me up. Thank you. No, it's true, though. <laughs> and since Sarah goes touring all over the world, check out if they're coming to a city near you, of course. Mm-hmm. Buy the music online, right? Yes. iTunes, Bandcamp. I'm going to put all the links in the description below so you Thank can check you. out all of her amazing music. But but really, it is, it's truly awesome music. So I hope you guys can all check it out because it's... Some of the best I've heard, honestly. So oh, thank you so much. Delighted. Thank you so much for doing this interview, Sarah. This Dude, has been you? very enlightening. I think uh, it's kind <laughs> of fascinating so. to see how much this stuff really costs. I think it's quite shocking. So thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope it was shocking for some and maybe not so much for others. Who knows? But we'll see. Hell yeah. Woo!